enjoyments that bond us? Is there a way that jouissance can bond groups, hold groups together? Well, if we look at the secondary literature, particularly if we look at someone like Slavoj Žižek, he will unconditionally say that what bonds a nation, for example, is a kind of enjoyment. Enjoyment, in a sense, is what you could say really consolidates a group. In some respects, you might say this is a troubling thesis. Given everything that you've told us about enjoyment, is that really what bonds a given community? One example that has proved pretty helpful in trying to teach some of this uh, material to um, undergrad students, certainly within the United States, is I gave students an assignment of going to go and look for bumper stickers. Bumper sticker is a whole new genre to me, at least. I suppose I had some exposure to it. But what I was a little bit surprised by is how often bumper stickers don't just express an ideal or a political choice, but they pretty clearly express a form of hate. And the reason I mention this is because you could say in some respects, again, a troubling thesis, that maybe enjoyment is a much more potent means of bonding a group, of holding a group, of consolidating a group, of building an identity than even the bonds of an ideal, of ego, of love. So around the corner from me, there's a guy who's got a sticker on his bump sticker on his car, and it just says, I hate Penn State. It's kind of like, dude, I think I'm kind of appalled, but impressed by that. You've got your six words that you can put in your bumper sticker. Of all the words in the English language, of all the values, of all the modes of subjectivity that you want to celebrate, I hate Penn State. So I started doing a whole lot more investigation of bumper stickers, and lo and behold, there's a whole panorama of different hating bumper stickers. Now, without belaboring the point too much, you could say that uh, much of the current American president's political campaign seems to be premised on this notion of consolidating a base via whipping up a certain kind of uh, jouissance and particularly a kind of antagonism or a kind of hate and, and bonding a group. Now, that's not any kind of rocket science analysis. It's pretty much commonplace analysis. Anyone might say that. Although, then again, some people who oppose that kind of logic would say, well, yeah, politicians always do that. There's nothing about the current American president that is particular, uh, particularly distinctive in that respect. I can take that argument to and fro, but I'm reminded of these political rallies where one of the rallying cries is, lock her up, lock her up. Now, even if you happen to be a Republican and you don't particularly like Hillary Clinton, maybe she's got her flaws, maybe she's a deeply flawed person. Is it really that necessary to have that amount of animosity? Again, we're not saying something particularly groundbreaking. We're saying that a certain kind of erotics of the negative, a negative affect, can bolster a kind of group bond and can be something that brings a group together. But where I'd go one step further is to say that why you could argue the Trump trap, as I call it, is so successful, is not only is there a bonding of a group, uh, a polarization, um, the creation of a kind of let's hate Hillary as a way of all coming together and let's hate a variety of other things as all coming together. The success of the Trump trap is even if you position yourself belligerently opposed to that, you still also start to feed into the politics of hate because your definition or your response to Trump is also one of jouissance, of one of hate. So the Trump trap is, is, is something that's difficult to break out of. And I think it also poses for us a question of how might we ethically think about jouissance? What is the ethical imperative in relationship to jouissance, an ethical imperative that we might say exists both within the clinic and within political life? And just to reiterate, the Trump trap, I think, is not just that there is uh, an arousal, an engendering of a certain kind of inflamed jouissance within a group, within his so-called um, <clears throat> base. But it's also that if you position yourself as liberal and opposed to Trump, you end up replicating some of that animosity, maybe in a different form or a different direction. But it, you could argue it's just as much hate headed back in the other direction. And let's also reiterate at this point that psychoanalytically, to have a figure who you hate, that you hate a great deal, is to invest in them. To hate someone is to make a huge libidinal investment in that person. It is to make them important. And I think that's the nature of the Trump trap, that even if you're opposed to Trump and you hate Trump, 
you're still investing back in Trump, who presumably loves that hate at some level. So how does one then break out of this kind of jouissance trap? Is it that one would need to somehow ignore someone like Trump? Well, presumably you can't just ignore them because if you're politically committed, that means a whole series of things are going to happen that you may not think is right. But it does at some level suggest that maybe one needs to take a step outside of that liberal animosity to not let your politics be fundamentally directed only by the jouissance incurred by one's enemies. That's a, a question. We'll leave that hanging. We'll come back to issues of what you could call national enjoyment, of jingoism, of nationalism in a few moments. We'll do that towards the end of our, our session. Um, but let's just make, while we're talking about the intersubjectivity of enjoyment, enjoyment as bonding us, let's also point out another facet of enjoyment. It's not only that enjoyment can be a bonding agent and a very powerful bonding agent, Enjoyment and the analysis of enjoyment can tell us something kind of interesting about human subjectivity. Um, uh, David Macy wrote one of the first books about uh, Lacan in English is often kind of dismissed because it's not you know, Lacanian enough for Lacanians. But in that book, maybe you know, there's some issues with the book, but one of the things that he said that's kind of important, I think, jouissance is not a category of pure subjectivity. It's not simply... I mean, I suppose in some ways I've been describing it in those terms. It's not simply uh, insulated or isolated within a given subjectivity. It doesn't have that singular setting, you might say. So it's not a category of pure subjectivity, but it implies a dialectic of possession and enjoyment of and by the other. So let's just think about that. That means then that enjoyment isn't something that is simply individually located, but it seems to always imply a kind of intersubjectivity. Let's give some examples. Here's a very basic example. Right at the beginning of these lectures, I asked you to imagine, well, I didn't, but I'm going to pretend I did, uh, someone flying into a rage, me flying into a rage. Let's say that I have a screaming match with my partner, I have a big fight. And of course, this is a kind of uh, uh, arousal of jouissance, despite that it's horrible, troubling, awful jouissance. In the course of this uh, fight, um, I, accuse, I accuse the person of, oh, you went out with someone and you had a relationship behind my back with someone else. And then, you know, all of these uh, uh, comments and quips and hurtful remarks are going this way and that way. And then my partner says, well, yes, I did. Not only did I have a relationship with him, but I liked it. I enjoyed it. And at that point, it's kind of like, oh, I just turn the knife in the wound. A more banal example of the same thing, years ago, I was on a treadmill and I saw a kind of completely uh, hopeless sitcom, but um, uh, uh, a woman comes into the room and her husband's trying to drink a beer and then he hides it and she says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm drinking a beer. And it becomes clear that they've had some agreement that he mustn't drink beer anymore. And as she comes forward, he, he grabs it and he drinks it more and more and he goes, oh, ah, and I enjoyed it. So in both of those cases, it's almost as if the subject who has somehow been affronted or injured, you can make that injury all the worse if the person injuring you tells you that they enjoy doing the thing that they're not supposed to. What does this tell us? This tells us in a way that you could say that individual jouissance, if we could speak about it like that, just momentarily, because we've said it doesn't really work to speak about it like that, it always seems to occur alongside a minus sign. What do I mean? It means that other people seem to enjoy at my expense. So when I experience jouissance, I often experience it by noticing, hey, that person is doing something too much um, to take a kind of homophobic logic. Gay men, they're always having sex, they're having too much sex. That's why I don't like gay men, because they're always having too much jouissance. So there's a kind of double logic here where other people's enjoyment seems to somehow subtract from mine or happen in a way that is toxic to me. It's too much. It's, it's, it's uh, repugnant. And also there's a sense that my jouissance is almost always under threat. Now, in the very last lecture in this series, we'll talk a lot more about racism and we'll see how something of that logic starts to be kind of useful there. One of the, the psychoanalytic and Lacanian theories of racism in that respect is initially developed by Jacqueline Miller in response to some comments from Lacan and then Slavoj Žižek builds on it. 
but it's this idea that racism is a kind of theft of enjoyment. And I just want to make one quick comment on that. Of course, it won't be quick, it'll be elaborate, it'll go on for too long, but whatever. You could say that in everyday psychological and sociological terms, we often have this idea that there's otherness and that we othering. Othering is often this word used, othering. We other someone, we make them more other. Once one has a good grasp of the notion of jouissance, that argument doesn't really work quite so well because it seems to imply that there's another subject, there's me, there's another subject, and I start to find them problematic, maybe for some quality that they have about them. I accentuate that. I turn them into someone that I can't identify with. They're other. You could argue in a slightly different way to that, that the human subjective experience of jouissance is one where my jouissance is always somewhat lacking. It's always experienced as something has been lost from it and that I could have a little more, or I should have more jouissance. Now we're squarely in the domain of neurosis here. The neurotic experience of jouissance is always like, I didn't quite get enough. If only, if only I could have this or that or that. I'm always striving for a little bit more, and my experience is that some of it's gone. Something hasn't been quite working. Could do with a bit more. And as soon as that logic's in place, there's a presumption that in order to explain this lack, this kind of castration, this kind of, I don't have enough, there's got to be a culprit. In other words, what I'm arguing is rather than saying there's me, there's another object, I blame the other object to make them problematic. I'm not dismissing that, but I'm saying another way of putting it is to say that the very fact that I experience my jouissance is somehow lacking. As soon as I start to narrativize that, there's an impetus to personify the, the, the lack. And the reason I don't have what I'm lacking and to locate someone and make them blameworthy. In other words, before any other even enters the scene, I'm already looking, as it were, unconsciously for a scapegoat for why my jouissance is somehow lacking. So I'm going to do a quick quote from a colleague and a friend. Uh, Yana Stavrakakis has written this book, uh, Lacan and the Political, I think in 1999. Um, it's, it's a wonderful example of, of how Lacanian theory can be brought into uh, a kind of progressive politics. But he makes a brief contribution to the whole notion of racism as theft of enjoyment. And uh, let's see if I can give the quote. What he is going to argue is that when we have national modes of enjoyment, and you could say here that any group whether it's some kind of intense affective investment in some kind of sporting victory or some kind of animosity, as we've been saying. You know, maybe you invest heavily in a sporting team that plays against Penn State. So rather than putting on your bumper sticker, I like, uh, I love uh, Duquesne University, your sticker reads, I hate Penn State. Anyway, so this is what he, um, what Yanis Debrakakis says. No matter how much we love our national ways of enjoyment, our national real, this real is never enough. It's always castrated. It is the real as staged in fantasy, in national myths and feasts. This is, never the, uh, this is never enough. There is a surplus which is always missing. Within the national fantasy, this loss can be attributed to the existence of an alien culture or people. The enjoyment lacking from our national community is being denied to us because they stole it. They are to blame for the theft. Of our enjoyment. They are fantasized as enacting in their own national rituals what they denied us. Now that may sound a little bit abstract, but I think it's it's a useful way of applying some of these Lacanian ideas to politics. So once again, it's not simply that there is another and that there's some kind of reasonable, rational response and that there's some misattribution made of the other. I think this is the kind of notion in, in social psycho many social psychological accounts of racism, that there's a misperception, that there's somehow an attribution to the other which is not quite realistic. Maybe to some degree you could say that's true. This seems to me a more radical thesis. It's suggesting that the very fact that I cannot attain full satisfaction, full enjoyment in and of myself, which we know within the domain of neurosis is by definition impossible, the very fact that that happens means I'm already looking out for some blameworthy reason to be able to allocate the reason for my lack. I mentioned earlier, could we think of a kind of ethics, both clinically and uh, politically, that stems from this notion? And I think you could give an answer here. You could say that the ethics is something akin to an ethics of castration. 
What do I mean by that? The ethics of castration then, particularly an example that Stavrakakis gives us, would be, maybe it's a very difficult move to make, rather than saying, let's blame Hillary, rather indeed than let's say, let's even blame Trump, although, you know, instead of that impetus to always be able to say some something is lacking in my enjoyment in my fulfillment and thereby necessarily ascribing someone as the cause of that problem the ethics of castration might be to take a step back and say well in certain situations maybe i was lacking all along maybe the very nature of being castrated i'll give you an example uh, for many years, I used to think, oh man, I want to be a writer. If only I had a bit more talent. If only I'd gone to university more. If only I'd done this. If only I'd done that. I wish my parents had sent me to that writing course. Wish this, wish that. You know, you find all these multiple different excuses and presumably also scapegoats. And at some point one realizes, oh, dude, Derek, there's stuff you can do. But that, that's not really one of them. In fact, in that sense, you could say that depending on the exact circumstance of the argument, we've got to be careful of extrapolating it too much, that being able to accept some facet of how one is not able to do something, or how one's, let's be more precise, how one's enjoyment has been circumscribed in some ways, is not the result of a migrant community, or is not the result of another race who's now seeming to take over half of my city. You could equally argue that there's any number of economic reasons and other facets why that's happening. And you could also say that part of what it means to be a human subject is to be somehow lacking in one's enjoyment. So maybe being a little bit more precise, as soon as there is a need or an impetus to be able to blame someone else for the lack of your own libidinal enjoyment, attaining some degree of uh, whatever, uh, gratification. One should take that moment and see whether that is more actually a fact of one's own lack rather than something that one can blame someone else on. So let's, uh, let's stop with that. And what we'll do in the next session is take up the question of profanity and we'll start to draw to a conclusion and see if we can wrap up these, these mini lectures on the topic of Jewish arts.